Welcome back. The world's eyes are on Washington, D.C. this morning. President Biden getting ready to greet world leaders for day two of the NATO summit, the first such summit since Finland and Sweden joined the alliance. The president using this visit to project confidence on the world stage, despite the political trouble he faces at home. And joining us now to discuss, New York Times diplomatic correspondent Michael Crowley and former Supreme Allied Commander at NATO, Admiral James Stavridis. Thank you both for joining us. Michael, let's start with the stakes for the president. He needs a strong showing at this summit. World leaders are concerned about the potential return to Donald Trump. What's he telling them? Well, a couple of things. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, one is that he is totally committed to NATO and to the transatlantic alliance that uh, America's support for Ukraine under his leadership is unwavering, that he is proud of what NATO has accomplished in the past several years as it's kind of found this renewed sense of purpose in standing up to Russian aggression. Um, but of course, there's also a message here, uh, which is that he is capable of remaining the Democratic nominee, continuing on as the president of the United States and saying that America will be here uh, under my leadership. People are counting me out, but I think he had a pretty good performance uh, by most accounts yesterday, uh, did much better than he seemed in that last debate. So he's also sending a signal about his own vitality and viability. Admiral, the president has vowed to uphold this alliance and he called defending Ukraine a sacred obligation. Trump doesn't share those views. Just moments ago, the White House confirmed that Ukraine will be receiving F-16s to Ukraine. Given what's happening at home, how fragile of a moment is this for NATO? Uh, it's extremely fragile if Donald Trump comes back in as president because he's been so overt both in his um, skepticism and criticality and negativity about the alliance, but also his seeming affection toward uh, Vladimir Putin. So uh, he says, and I'm quoting, that he will solve the Ukrainian war on day one, in one day. Uh, that will not happen, in my view. Uh, but it's got to make the people in Kyiv pretty nervous because it implies asking them to accept a very bad set of terms. I'll close with this. What's the value proposition for the NATO alliance, which I hope is what Trump advisors will make if he comes in? And it's kind of money, guns, and lawyers. And what I mean by that is money, you're looking at the leaders of over 50% of the world's gross domestic product, guns, collectively, that is the second largest defense budget in the world. Uh, after the United States, larger than China. And lawyers, I'll use a shorthand for values. We stand together for rule of law. I think the value case can be made for NATO, but with Donald Trump, it's going to be an uphill struggle from what we know now, and, Anna. And, and Admiral, when we talk about it being a fragile moment, have we ever seen anything like this moment in the history of the alliance? No, and uh, throughout my lifetime, my uh, my long 40 year career in the military, certainly there were conversations about uh, burden sharing and making sure that our NATO partners paid more. That's an active conversation and they have gotten better at that in the last four or five years, spurred on by uh, Vladimir Putin, frankly. But there has never been a moment of extreme acrimony like this and, and previously, the biggest moment of the alliance was the activation of Article 5, the defense of the United States, following the attack on 9-11. A very uh, dark day for the alliance, having to respond to an attack, but one of real unity and strength. I don't think there's been a moment previously where you could talk about that transatlantic bridge breaking. It's creaked a little bit from time to time. I've never been more worried about it. 30 plus NATO countries now. Michael, the president we know has significant foreign policy experience. He's have this great history of building relationships and international uh, diplomacy. He's got these partners and it's something that he really prides himself in. How much does this summit play to President Biden's strengths at this pivotal time in the world and, and domestically for him? Is the president in his comfort zone right now? Absolutely. Comfort zone, sweet spot. 
I think, again, this is a president who came of age in the Cold War. Um, he was very involved in, in sort of strategic uh, debates about how to stand up uh, against the Soviet Union, um, the NATO expansion debates of the 1990s. Uh, he's had close relationships with many European leaders and diplomats. He likes them. Uh, you know, I've studied his foreign policy record, and I really think that this is the subject that has animated him most over decades. So this is his comfort zone. And so it's no surprise that he would be doing well here this week. You know, how much that says about how well he's going to run a national campaign, that's for others to decide. But I think that if you're going to showcase president, and by the way, it's also one of his great success stories. Uh, uh, you know, NATO really uh, has, President Biden has helped NATO um, unify, uh, show uh, impressive st strategic uh, thinking, um, unity within the alliance. And he's, I think, rightly proud of the record of NATO in fending off the Russian invasion of Ukraine up to a point. Of course, uh, there's there's still uh, Russia still occupying much of Ukraine. But this is a great showcase for him, I think, for the White House and frankly, for his campaign right now. Michael Crowley and Admiral James Stavridis, thank you both. I always value your expertise and appreciate you taking the time. Up next on.